It's a focus, okay? Everything that I talk about this morning will be geared in that direction. And I feel like our role here as a church, it is to come together to fellowship, to build one another up. But we conduct Bible studies and hear messages, not just to attain information, right? The purpose that we are allowing the Word to impact us, to transform us, to change us through the Holy Spirit is because we need to apply it in our lives in practical ways. Otherwise, it's just information and really of no value. And so I'm going to do my best to try to see if we can find some ways in which we can apply what we uh, learned today in a real way and how we can minister towards the sick. So last week we talked about there was four ways that we can serve the least. And so we're going to focus on those again. I like that because it just categorizes just each way that we can serve the least. And if you recall, the first way was doing four. Doing four is helping those who cannot help themselves, right? Then we talked about doing with, empowering, walking alongside somebody so they can do for themselves, right? It's like instead of giving somebody fish, you teach them how to fish. And so they can be more independent. And then we talked about being for, which was more about advocacy, speaking up for the voiceless, for the powerless. And the last one, which we touched on, was being with. And that's the Christian ideal, is being with. And the reason why this is a Christian ideal is to be with, and we'll get to that in a second, is because that's how we will spend eternity with God. Right? One day when God returns and establishes His kingdom, the Bible promises that there will be no sickness, that there will be no death, there will be no crying, there will be no sorrow. We see flashes and glimpses of His kingdom now through His ministry, through His healing ministry especially, right? Where people are healed, we see flashes of the kingdom. But when He returns for His church, we will see His kingdom and all His glory, and there will be no death and no sickness. And all we have to do is be with not only him, but also be with others as we spend the rest of our lives in eternity with God and his children, the church. So I want to make the case that in order to get there to being with God, that should be our Christian ideal. That's where we should be striving to get to. We're going to have to do things for people. We're going to have to walk alongside people and empower them and encourage them we're also going to have to be a voice for the voiceless, for the powerless. And so in the case of sick, I just wanted to present a few biblical examples of how Jesus Christ did for those who cannot help themselves. And I'm just going to go straight to the passion of the Christ, his death on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Humanity is sick and needed healing. Jesus did not come for the healthy, he says, but he came for the sick, those who need a physician. Another example, all through the Gospels, we hear about healing miracles, sight to the blind, healing various diseases and torments that demon possessed, epileptics, paralytics. Matthew 9.35 says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So what does that mean to us today, especially in the hospital setting? In the hospital setting, we have people that we need to be doing for them, right? You got medical staff that are physicians and nurses that have expertise in their field. And a good example that I can use for somebody that needs things to be done for them because they cannot help themselves is in the case that someone arrives in the emergency department, really bad accident. In this case, every single detail of their medical care right, from food preparation, from a scheduling of their medication. Sometimes they can't even talk. Most of the time they can't walk in an emergency setting. So there's a high level of involvement of other people in the life of this person that just experienced a tragic accident. You also have many programs out there that deal with medical care that try to do for others who cannot do for themselves. A perfect example of our organization that does this is uh, Doctors Without Borders that go overseas 
and they'll provide medical care for people in other countries that don't have access to medical care or don't have the finances to be able to buy it. We have that side of the kind of, we can say, the hard skills of medical care. There's nurses and, and, and uh, physicians that have expertise in their field. They know all the things work in the hospital, the technology that gives life, that helps people get healing. They know how to work those. They have specialized training. So those, we could say, are the hard skills of bringing people to healing. But then you have the soft skills, and that's where spiritual care comes in. The soft skills are more about praying for the sick. There's a, a ministry of healing. It's amazing what just laying, putting your hands on somebody and knowing that you're there and praying for them, how healing that can be. Also listening. And these are all things that we can do as a church, right? We can provide spiritual care for the people that, that God puts in our path. One of the examples that a chaplain, but I'm going to use the example of a chaplain, but you can also apply it in your lives. It doesn't have to just be a chaplain. So there was a case where there was a family member and uh, there was a family that got into an accident and everybody got injured, including the father and the mother. So, and there was two kids. And so nobody was able to provide uh, spiritual care and presence for the kids. And so the church decided to get together and they appointed one person from the church to go and spend time with each person that was in a car accident, father, mother, and with the two children. And so this is what spiritual care is about. And this is what doing for, sometimes you have to do for people what they cannot do for themselves. And the church can be invaluable in the scenario. Then you have doing with the sick, doing with the sick, is more about empowering the sick, giving them the tools so they can become independent. Let's say that after a bad accident, this person, amazing strides in their health, and they had the support of their community, the doctors did wonders in their life, and they're making great strides in their health. And now they're learning to get back on their feet. So you have the physical therapist working with them. You have now they're not in the hospital. Now they're outside of the hospital, and you got uh, people from the hospital staff calling them, making sure that they're making progress, making sure that they're taking their medications. But for the most part, they're responsible for their own care, right? The staff of the hospital calls because they want to make sure that they're exercising, that they're taking their medications, that they're eating right. Doing with the sick has to do with helping others get back on their feet. And I think last time, the example that I used was a homeless person. And so the way that we would empower a homeless person would be to connect them with the right resources, maybe get them some training, or connect them with someone that we know from HR at a company. So that would be a different scenario. In this scenario, for the sick, we would just make sure that they're progressing in their health. How can the church do with somebody who is sick? not do for anymore because you're not doing everything for them anymore. Now they're able to function independently, right? They don't need all the help that was needed previously. As a church, how can we do with somebody that is sick? And so here I have a few examples. So in this case, we want to draw out their own spirituality so they can begin practicing it on their own. So some of the ways that we can harness this is we can give them resources, right? So they can continue practicing their uh, spiritual disciplines, um, prayer, so they can begin praying on their own, giving them literature for devotions or maybe a Bible. We can also connect them with a faith community. This is a great place where we can connect people from the hospital that are going back into their neighborhoods and make sure that they have the support of a faith community. All kinds of research has been made regarding the impact that a faith community has on, on a patient and healing. It's incredible how much a faith community and the impact they can have on someone who is sick. But doing with the sick means that we're walking with them as they progress. We're encouraging them, right? We're maybe teaching them how to, empowering them to be able to use spiritual resources that they have available. But we want them to start doing it on their own, right? 
So now we go to being for the sick. Being for the sick is more about advocacy, right? Standing up for those who cannot speak for themselves, the powerless. In the Bible, we have uh, lots of scenarios where friends and relatives are advocating for their loved ones. In one case, we have Martha and Mary sent after Jesus because their brother Lazarus had passed away. They went after Jesus saying, our brother Lazarus has passed away. We need for you to come and heal him. If you remember the story about the four men who brought the sick person to Jesus, but they couldn't get in through the door. So they had to bring him in through the roof. And so that is advocating for others who are powerless, who are voiceless. In this case, this man couldn't get to Jesus. They had to intervene and take this paralyzed man over to Jesus so he can be healed. How can we apply this in medical care? How do we advocate for the sick in the medical context that we live in? I would say that many in retirement communities, and I think most of us know somebody that would be in the retirement community, but oftentimes people that are in these communities don't get a lot of visitors. And there's cases where they're mistreated. So someone needs to go and be their voice and make sure they're getting the proper care. Another example would be maybe someone doesn't have the finances or the insurance for a particular treatment. So they go and try to advocate for them and try to contact an agency. They can get the treatment that they need in order to be able to survive. There's all kinds of ways that we can advocate for others. Sarah was telling me that a lot of the hospital staff have to negotiate and kind of fight against the insurance companies to make sure that the patients get the proper medication that they need, especially when it's really expensive. You know, insurance companies will really try not to pay for the expensive medication that some of the patients need. One of the examples of that just happened recently, right, that I thought would, is a good illustration to show how we can advocate for others and how someone was advocating for a loved one was when someone donates their organ to somebody else, they're advocating for them, they're giving them another, another chance at life. There's a ministry or there's an organization called Life Gift. And I was totally impressed with this. There was somebody who had passed away. They were an organ donor. So this organization, Life Gift, basically they orchestrated all the pieces of the puzzle so there was people all over the country that could get these organs since they were the organ, they passed away. So they harvested their organs. They sent planes in from all over the country so they can take these organs back to the other hospitals scattered across the country and they can get the care that they needed. They can get the organ that they needed. So this is advocating for others who are in need. As a church, how can we advocate for others that are powerless, that don't have a voice. We can, as a chaplain, I try to make sure that someone is visiting the patients at the hospital. Sometimes I have to do a little bit of investigation, see who the family members are, where they live, try to contact them, see if they can come and visit. You'd be surprised how important the support of friends and family is to healing. Sometimes I would try to contact the faith community, maybe speak to the pastor or somebody in the church, let them know what's happening, that, that the patient needs support. This is stuff that we can all do, right? Advocate for the sick. We can advocate for others through prayer. You know, as a church intercedes on behalf of people that are sick. And what I thought was cool is that at the hospital, they have something called NODA, which stands for Nobody Dies Alone. And so as a chaplain and as believers, I think we have to be curious. We have to listen to people with attention because we never know what's really behind the scenes. And oftentimes what happens is that there'll be patients at the hospital and they have no one to visit them. And so in this case, there's a policy at the hospital called NOTA that nobody dies alone. And so we make sure that we contact one of the volunteers that is assigned to our hospital and make sure that that person has somebody in the room providing companionship for them during this critical time. Probably the worst thing that I can imagine at the hospital is for somebody to have to die alone or be sick even alone. That's something that nobody deserves. And everybody deserves to have somebody close to them.
during this critical time, during, during their critical time. So that's advocating for others. That's being for others who are sick. So up to this point, I've covered the first three, which are doing for, basically doing most of the work for the patient because they can't help themselves. I covered doing with, walking alongside the sick, making sure they're making progress, making sure they're staying on schedule, making sure they're taking their medications. Then there's advocating for, which is being for. Make sure that we're intervening for the sick. Make sure that we're a voice to them to make sure that they're getting the proper care, that, that they're being visited. That's being for, advocating for others. Which leads to the last one, just being with the sick. And like I had said earlier, this would be the ideal, right? That we can just be with the sick. And the reason why this is the ideal is because that is the vision of the kingdom of God, that there'll be no sickness, there would be no death. And so when we can finally be able to just be with people, that means that God has returned and established his kingdom forever. But we don't know when that will happen, but we do see flashes of it. But let me talk a little bit about being with the sick. Let's say there's a scenario with a patient that all the attempts have been made to fix the sickness. They tried everything. They tried a organ transplant. They tried walking with the patient. They, everything possible that you can do for a patient, they've tried, but nothing is helping. The patient just is continuing to get sicker and sicker and they're not progressing there's no amount of medication or any other type of medical intervention that will help the sick person and so we can say that in this place the person is dying which is hard to hear but that's a reality there's people at the hospital that are dying and probably every day there's several people that die in the hospital system but this can be extremely frustrating for the medical staff you have doctors very talented individuals, you have nurses that have years of experience, that have all the technology. This is the most advanced medical system in the world. And sometimes even they have human limitations. And I've seen instances where doctors have given patients kind of a false hope, saying, well, we have another option. So they give them a glimmer of hope, which then just makes the situation worse. And then the family's upset because they felt lied to, and uh, you can just imagine how chaotic and how tense the situation can be. But this is a humbling experience for all of us at the hospital and dealing with the sick because we get to a place that no matter how talented we are, no matter how much expertise we have in caring for the sick, we're not always a able to fix people's problems and, or their sickness. We're not able to bring them to health. And this is the reality. But also, it just shows that there's only one guarantee in life, and that guarantee is that we're all going to die at some point. But in our culture, that's not popular, right? We don't even like to talk about this reality. But we should, especially with the church. And it shouldn't be something so gloomy if we really look at it. It shouldn't be so gloomy because we have hope. So I'll get to that in just a second, about the hope that we have in Christ even though we are sad that the person has passed away. We know that even though we might be a little bit selfish in that time, let's say we would like for them to be here, and that's understandable. But the hope that we have is that they're in a place in God's presence, that there's no death, no sorrow, there's no sickness. By wanting to keep them, them here, we're just keeping them from paradise, which is okay because it's, it's part of the grieving process. We have loved ones and we want them to be with us. But some of the examples of how we can be with others is hospice. Everything has been tried. They just can't, the person is not getting better. So what they do is try to give them the best comfort care possible. That the remaining days that they have, it could be a few days or it could be weeks or it could be months. To make sure that it's quality time. That they can take that time to be with family, to enjoy their life, and there's minimal suffering. As a church, there's certain things that we can do in order to be with those that are in hospice or, or that are dying, we can say. It's not a comfortable place to be, right? It's not easy to be with someone that is in that place. And I've been there many times, and I've only been involved at the, at the hospital for about nine months so far, and I've seen plenty of sorrow and I've seen 
plenty of death and I've seen plenty of sickness. The suggestions that I might make is because I've been trying to deal with it myself and seeing how I can be as a chaplain in order to provide spiritual care for those in a critical state. What it boils down to, you don't have really a lot of words. In that moment, the patient knows that they're dying. The family members are are crushed and in agony. You're kind of at a loss for words. And you know what? That's okay. It's Sometimes it's just better not to say anything because in the in the moment of anxiety and tension, the wrong thing is going to come out. So this is when presence is so important. Let me just talk a little bit about presence. Even when we have no solution to the problem, we have no news of other options that could help. All we have to offer is ourselves. As a church, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, God's presence. We can only be with the patient for their sake and not for what we can do for them. And this is the beginning of just being with. We can give them a glimpse of what the afterlife holds when they're going to be in God's presence forever. So through our lives, through our presence, we can give them a glimpse of that reality. That soon, that same being with that we're providing for them, that presence, they will be able to experience that with God himself. We also pay attention to them. We means we focus and listen to the person who is dying during that time. Trying to do for can kill the moment. We're so distracted on what we can do for them that we miss the person and just being with them during that time. Just paying attention to them. You know, we can be so caught up in all the activities and contacting the family members and speaking with the the physicians and the nurses and this and that, that we can... And possibly some people do it because they just can't cope with the reality, right? So they're trying to find an outlet to stay busy because that's how they feel that they're being useful. It's just by being busy, but we're missing the person that really needs our presence, our attention, us being there with them. Another thing that we can do is it can be out loud or it can just be in our own thoughts. And that's okay. We can honor the person in our minds, in our thoughts. We can think about the life that they lived. If the person is a grandmother or a mother, we can think about the people, her her children that she brought into, into life and who she raised. This body that we see there is a person that had meaning and purpose in life, uh, that bore children. Through their life, we can think about all the people that they impacted, all the lives that they touched. When we touch their hand during that time, we can think about how many people that hand touched. When we look at their ears, we can think about how many sounds they heard. When we see their mouths, we can think about all the prayers that were lifted up to God during that time. All the words of encouragement that they spoke to others. All the Bible studies and all the service that was done unto God through their mouth. In our society, like I had said before, it doesn't like to deal or face death, but it is a reality at least temporarily. But it's important to come to terms with death because this is the only guarantee we have in this life as Christians besides salvation. But I'm talking about here on earth as we have life. As Christians, we can be instrumental during this time to provide hope and love and be God's representatives. For believers, we have hope in this circumstance and can make a difference in the lives of the sick and their families. A few examples of how, even though Jesus has not come to establish his kingdom, right? The Bible talks about Jesus just being present with us. That's his ideal and that's his preference. He didn't seek out to heal people. He Really, his ideal is just to be with people. But the other stuff he did, the doing for and the being being with and, and all the other ones, he did because he wanted to eventually, he wanted to just be with people. It Just think about it. If you know somebody and uh, you're constantly doing four, it's okay to do do four a few times, but after a while it kind of gets a little old, right? Or just being with. uh, If you're constantly or doing with, if, if you feel like you're constantly having to encourage them, you have your limitations on what you can do. But when you can just be with somebody, don't feel like you have to do anything and just be with them for their sake, because you want to spend time with them. They want to spend time with you with no agenda, no plan, no purpose. 
really, that's where we're able to be, really be present with people. Some of the examples of how Jesus was present during his life here on earth was the 30 years prior to his ministry. It was 30 years. We hardly hear anything about his life in the Gospels. We hear about his birth. And also when he was 12 years old, he was kind of having a debate with some of the Pharisees. But other than that, we really don't hear much about his life. And that's about 90% of his life. He was just with his people. He was a carpenter. He had brothers and sisters. He had an earthly father. He, then he had Mary. He was just a regular person living their life in, in his context, which was Nazareth. Nazareth is where he spent 30 years of his life. And really, his ministry started when he was 30 years old, and it lasted three years. So that's about 10% of his life was him doing for others. But the majority of his life, 90% was just being with, because we don't really hear anything about him. At his birth, we hear about the prophecy from Isaiah that named him Emmanuel, right? Which is the Hebrew word for God with us. That's his purpose. That's his ultimate goal is just to be with us one day. The Great Commission, he promises to be with us wherever we may go. He says, go out and make disciples of all nations and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I will be with you. I will be with you wherever you go. And I want to get to the last part. When he establishes his kingdom forever, we read in Revelations 21 verses 1 through 4, when he establishes the new heavens and the new earth and he makes everything new, we live in a new creation. It says that he will dwell with us. God himself will be with us and be our God for eternity. So let's say that person is dying. They only have, there's been instances where basically they're just trying to get the family there before they unplug. The family shows up, everybody's gathered around this person, and they're ready to just pull the plug. So they pull the plug, turn off all the devices. Sometimes a person lasts a minute, sometimes longer, sometimes less. Depends. The reason I bring this up, even though it's a dark image, is because we got to understand that this is not the end for that person. This is only the beginning of that person, if there are believers in Christ. At Christ's return, so that body that is laying on that bed, I'm going to finish with this part, and I think it's important that we understand it. I had to take some time to really study it so I can understand it about what happens to us when we die. Because I felt like the only way that I can be present in the moment is because I really have to understand about the afterlife and what will happen to our bodies. So I'm just going to say a few things about this because I feel like it's important so we have hope. We know that where our destination lies. We know that we have salvation. We know that death is nothing to fear because it's just the beginning of our life with God and God with us. The body will be resurrected with a soul in a perfected, glorified state. That broken body, imperfect body, that body that is ridden with, with sin and sickness will be resurrected the same way that Jesus' body was resurrected. Remember, they were poking at him and thinking that maybe he was a ghost. No, they were touching real flesh and bones after he resurrected. He was in his perfected form, even though he was sinless. In our case, we're going to be resurrected into our new heavenly bodies in our glorified state. And I can't explain exactly how this will happen. The best I can offer is the analogy of a seed which is planted in the ground. The seed does not come back to life until it dies. And you can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 36. In the same way, we die in order to sprout back to life in a better version of ourselves. We will one day be fully restored, redeemed, and resurrected, both body and soul. Referring to the resurrection of the whole person, the Apostle Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42, that believers will transition from corruption to incorruption. In our new resurrected bodies, 
we will be free from death and live in God's presence and his kingdom forever. Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 2. In our new bodies, we are promised there in Revelation chapter 21 verses 4. No death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Let me just finish with this. The Apostle Paul was torn in two. He says, I would rather much be in God's presence. I would rather die. Because of his ministry, he went through a lot of affliction, a lot of suffering. But there's so much for me to still do. There's so many people that need Christ. So I'd much rather stay here for the purpose and plan that God has for me than to depart then I can't impact and do God's work here on earth. So what I want to say is, God has a special plan and purpose. Let us take advantage of that time. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Tomorrow is, we don't know if it will come. And so let us take the time, the life that God has given, to be able to fulfill the purposes that He has in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 190.